Assalamualaikum, uh, selamat pagi, good morning. Welcome back to the course SIG 1005, Introduction to Fossils. So this is the second lecture to introduce you to practical number two, where we'll be covering the first uh, groups of fossils right? in, in, the, in practical number one. Uh, we looked at uh, types of fossil preservation. So now we're starting to look at the different fossil groups. And we start with the simplest groups first, um, Protista, Porifera, and Nidaria. Okay, so let's look at the first group. This is Phylum Protista. This includes um, all um, microscopic organisms composed of a single cell, okay? unicellular organisms. For those of you in biology, uh, you might ask uh, why we're using the term phylum protista. Um, it is an unnatural taxonomic group, right? So uh, it's an old term uh, where you group uh, lots of different kinds of microorganisms, all of them single cell, but they might have different origin. Some of them have mixed uh, plant and animal-like uh, characteristics. Some of them are more plant-like, some of them more animal-like. But um, just for simplicity's simplicity sake, we just make it the story simple in this class. In this class, which is, which is an, uh, this is a first year introductory course. Let's just stick with the traditional classification called the phylum protista. Okay, so single cell organisms, and we are interested in one class, the class Sacodina. Okay, so if you remember your secondary school and matriculation uh, biology, uh, you remember amoeba. Right? So this is amoeba, and amoeba uh, has pseudopods, right? tentacle-like uh, protrusions here, in order for it to capture food. Right? So that is the main character to identify members of the class Sacodina. And uh, we are interested in this course with two orders. Okay? So order foraminifera, the forams, and the radiolaria. Let's do all this here. Now, why are we only interested in these two groups? Well, because they have that one important uh, character that results in the, the likely, uh, uh, the increased likelihood of their preservation as, as fossils. They have hard parts. Okay? So both of these have an, an internal skeleton made up of a certain mineral. So let's look at these two. So the age range is given here. Yeah? So order for Raminifera ranges from Ordovician to recent. Uh, Radiolarians are from Cambrian to recent. So meaning that they are still around today. So let's look at order for Raminifera and its characteristics. So for Raminifera also has pseudopods, have a, a soft body structure, just like amoeba. Right? But it also has an internal skeleton we are most interested in. Uh, and the, uh, the skeleton uh, is called a test. Okay, So a shell of a foram is called a test. Okay, um, And the test is made up of a, is made up of hard calcareous material. So it's made up of calcium carbonate. Or a test made up from agglutinated grains of sand. Sand which is stuck together by an organic cement. Okay. So forams are microfossils. In size, they are very small. Okay, uh, size range is commonly between 0 0.1 to 1 millimeter, but you can get big examples up to five centimeters long. Okay. Now the test can be divided into chambers. There's lots of rooms inside the test. Okay, lots of empty spaces. So that's uh, an important character of the order foraminifera. Okay, notice I'm using the, um, I'm interchanging with, with the um, uh, foraminifera with forams. It's, it means the same thing, it's just that forams is a short form and easier to, easier to talk, uh, easier to, well, talk about. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's look at the life habit and habitat or environment of the forams. Most forams are aquatic, they live in water. They are mainly marine. So live in seawater, some of them in brackish water, and also you get uh, some forums living in fresh water. You can have 
forens which are planktonic, which means that they live floating in the water column, right? Plankton, right? Uh, some other forens are benthic and they live on the seafloor. Okay, you can have both. So, in this class, you need to know two, la two main groups, uh, forens. So these are informal groups, not really formal taxonomic groups. You have one, what we call the larger forums. They're called larger forums because they are relatively larger. That's it. Right? It's just based on relative size. And then you have your smaller forums, right? And the larger forums um, are divided into the fusulinates, spindle-shaped uh, forums, and the coin-shaped numulated. You need to know these two groups. And in the smaller forums group. You need to know uh, the agglutinated forams and also the globigerinates. Okay. So let's go through these groups one by one. Okay, so that's the that's the taxonomy here that we're using in this course for order for Raminifera, divide into the larger and smaller forams, the larger forams divide into the fusilinates and the numulitids, and in the smaller forams we have the agglutinated forams. And also the globi gerinids. So the larger forens. Look at first group, uh, the fusulinids. Taxonomically, these are under the suborder Fusulinina. Right? Uh, look at the age range. It is from late Carboniferous to the Permian. So these forens are extinct. You don't find them in modern day environments where they're extinct. Right? They're proposed. Uh, fusulinids are important fossils in for determining the age of late Paleozoic rocks right? from late Carboniferous onward. And they are very good index fossils if you want to do correlation between late Paleozoic rocks. Okay. So, for uh, fusulinids are large forams. They have a calcareous test made up of calcium carbonate, and the test can be large. You can relatively large, yeah, for, for microfossils, uh, up to five centimeters long. They have a very distinct shape, uh, but the test is fusiform. It has a cigar or rugby shape, or more like grains of rice, like a mutir brass. Yeah, so these are individual uh, fusulinids in a limestone rock. Okay. They can be very abundant and they are rock forming. Right? So you have this fusilinid bearing limestone. So, like all foramin uh, foraminifera, uh, fusilinids also have chambers. And the chambers are elongate. They are elongate par parallel to a long axis, long disorientation. So, this is a chamber here, the empty space. right? And if you make a cross section, uh, at the right angles to the long axis, this is what you get. A coiled shape to the test. And here you see the numerous chambers. Right? Separated by septa walls. Okay. So uh, in terms of life habit and habitat, um, it appears to be that all fossilinates are marine microorganisms, uh, were marine microorganisms, and they were benthic, living on the seafloor. Next group of larger forams. These are the numulitids, and they are much younger, so they are um, they are restricted to the tertiary, right? So from the Eocene up to the Oligocene. Then right? after that, they became extinct. So remember, uh, in this course, always refer back to the geologic time scale. So you need to know, you need to know the different periods, eons, and eras. So. Uh, so you get really familiar with the geologic time scale. Uh, so you need to, there's going to be a little bit of road learning here. You need to memorize that. Things like Cretaceous is uh, after the Jurassic, and you need to know Triassic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, and so on. These are important things. It is a common language between geologists. So everybody, everybody in geology knows what Cenozoic means, and so on. Okay, so learn early. It's going to be, uh, it's going to help you later on in the program, the geology program. Yeah? And even after, when you get to work, 
you're still going to use this term. Okay? So no harm done in memorizing these things. Okay, back to the lecture. Age range um, is eocene to oligocene for pneumolytids. They are large foraminifera, one to five centimeters in diameter. They have a calcareous test, just like the fusulinids, but the test shape is very different. It's no longer rugby shaped or rice grain shape, but coin shape. Macam tu ishiling, yeah? You have a flattened test. The test is still coiled, just like a fusulinid, but at a different orientation. It's now coiled around a short axis. Right? So this is a thin section of one of these uh, pneumolytids here. You make a thin section uh, cutting through this part here, which is, uh, so the cross section is parallel to the long axis. Okay? So the short axis is through this, um, the, this orientation here, right? So you still get the coiling. Right, it's now coiled around the short axis. Okay? And here you still see the chambers separated by the walls. Now this is another cross-section, but now the, the cross-section is parallel to short axis, right? Cutting in a different orientation. You can see, still see the chambers here separated by walls of the coils. Okay, so those are numulatives. Just to show you here again, um, I mentioned that uh, uh, fusulinates can be rock can be rock forming. They are very abundant in certain stratigraphic horizons, right? So this is an outcrop exposure from this is at Bukit Tunku Lembu uh, in Berseri Perlis, very near to MRS Embassy, the school MRS Embassy, and these rocks contain ripples and large large scale ripples here, right? Symmetrical ripples. And the bed here can actually be correlated for several kilometers in the north-south uh, in the north-south direction. Okay. Now, if you make thin sections of this bed here, and you notice that it's made up of lots and lots of pusulinates. You can still see this from the thin section. There's the coil uh, shape of the test, and those are the chambers separated by the walls. Okay. So they are very abundant. In, in rock, in, in certain rocks. Okay. Okay. Now let's move on to the smaller foraminifera. These are relatively smaller compared to the fusulinates and the pneumolytids. Is well, um, first group. This is these are the agglutinated forams. Um, well, the agglutinated forams actually. Uh, are composed of lots of different types of forams which are lumped together into this group. Okay, uh, so they may have different origins. Uh, so the age range is very wide. So you're going from Cambrian up to the recent. So it's very, we are still around today. Now the characteristics are very different from the larger forams that we looked at. Uh, now you still have a test. But the test is not no longer made up of calcium carbonate. It's just made up of accumulated sand grains. So notice these are individual sand grains. It's like the microorganism just picks up lots and lots of gra grains of sand to form its skeleton. Right? And the sand grains are glued together by a cement. It's organic or calcareous in nature. So in terms of life habit and habitat, uh, these are marine microorganisms. And they live on the seafloor. These are benthic. Next group of so smaller forams, uh, the globigerinids. Now, globigerinids of the suborder Globigerina, these are very important index fossils um, for the Cenozoic. Okay? Um, so, very helpful in correlating sediments and sedimentary rocks of the Cenozoic okay, throughout the world. Uh, the age range is from the Cretaceous to recent. Uh, in terms of characteristics, they are small and they have a calcareous test, and the test the, the test wall is very thin. Okay? And they also have chambers, of course, for four amps, but the chambers are swollen and globular in shape. So these are the swollen chambers of the four amp. Okay? So wherever you find small um, a small four amp with Lots of these globular chambers yeah, making up the skeleton. 
and these will be classified as globigerinids. And globigerinids are planktonic marine microorganisms. Okay, going back to the taxonomy here, we've, uh, uh, we've looked at, we're looking at phylum protista, single cell microorganisms, only members of the class Psychodina, who, uh, where they capture food with pseudopods. We looked at the forams, which have, a, uh, have the, which have a calcareous skeleton. And also, yeah, we looked at uh, the other types of, uh, yeah, looked at um, larger forams and smaller forams, right? So let's look at the next order. You had the order foraminifera. Let me look at the next order, which is order radiolaria. Okay, we're done with forams now. Look at the radiolaria. So order radiolaria. The age range is very long. They, they have, uh, they've been around since the Cambrian and are still around today. They are not extinct. So the characteristics, they are very different in terms of the composition of the test. They also have an internal test. Uh, the test now is made up of opaline silica. So SiO2, eh? silicon dioxide. Okay. Um, and these are examples of, of radiolaria tests. And they have lots of different kinds of shapes. Eh? But lots of, uh, they're characterized by lots of pores inside the skeleton. Okay, so very diverse shapes. Just to show examples here of the diversity of the shapes, these are uh, these are Permian age radiolaria. Yeah, these are from Malaysia. I just show you examples from the Bentong Rao suture. Right. Um, in terms of life habit and life habitat, um, uh, radiolarians are marine microorganisms and they are planktonic. They live in the water column, floating around in the sea. Okay, so we're done with the simple single cell microorganisms. Let's go to the next level of complexity. Uh, so we're looking at uh, more complex organisms now. The second phylum is phylum porifera. You know them as sponges. Right? So sponges are an ancient lineage. They've been around since the Precambrian. Okay, one of the earliest types of multicellular organisms and are still around today. Uh, sponges are simple, but they are multicellular, more than one cell, right? but not as complex as other metazoans. Right? The multicellular, but uh, more simple structure. Uh, they have skeleton, a skeleton and can form different shapes, uh, but all of them have lots of pores, holes and channels, because these animals are filter feeders. They circulate water through the skeleton. Um, the skeleton is composed of these two elements here. You have spicules, which are needle-like structures. These are spicules under an electron microscope. Okay? They're needle-like, and they can be made up of calcium carbonate or silica. Then you also have fibers of this, this organic uh, substance that we call spongin which also forms the skeleton of some sponges, okay? So in terms of uh, the life habit and habitat, you can have marine sponges, you can also have freshwater sponges. They are benthic animals, they live on the seafloor, and they are filter feeders. Okay? Just to show you a, a photo of a sponge here, lots of those, the main uh, opening in the middle here, and the anim animal is filter feeding. Okay, so you have the skeleton here, and made up of lots of cells, and also skeleton made up of spicules and spongin fibers. Phylum porifera is separated into these three classes in this course. You have first class calci spongea, uh, then class hyalo spongea, and then class demo spongea. You are classifying the sponges here uh, based on the composition of the spicule. Now, in the rock record, most of the time, you don't get the whole body of the sponge being preserved. That is a rarity. Those are precious things. Right? Most of the time, the sponge disintegrates after dying, 
and it is uh, most of the time you just find lots and lots of piquels inside the rock. Yeah, that's how you identify your sponges. So the the shape uh, is not really that uh, important in character in identifying them in the geologic record. Okay. So all these are based on composition. We have test calci spongia. These are the calcareous sponges. We have spicules made up of calcium carbonate. They have an age range from the Devonian to the recent. Then you have the class hyalo spongia. Right? These are the glass sponges. They have a skeleton made up of silica. This looks very fragile, but it's, it's, it's still quite hard. You touch it, right? Uh, yeah, so this is class hyalo spongia. Then you have the demo spongia. Uh, these have a skeleton made up of a combination of spongin and siliceous spicules, which may or not be present. Now let's look at the final group that we will we'll be looking at uh, today in this course. Um, the phylum Nidaria. Right? Now, you know this group uh, because it's still around today. Yeah? People, you guys, I know you guys, you guys are very active outdoors. Uh, some of you have gone to diving and so on. So, you know them as corals, jellyfish, and sea anemones. So, these are members of the phylum Nidaria. And it is also an ancient lineage that has been around since the pre -Cambian. And we are not extinct, we are still around today. They are still simple multicellular organisms, but they are relatively more complex compared to the sponges. Right? Uh, sponges are very simple. So they're just like a, a large jumble of lots and lots of cells. But there's more arrangement to the final area, and you also have a well-developed nervous system. That the that the system sara. Right? Um, Nidarians have a radially symmetrical body plan, right? So, like this animal, this jellyfish here, it's radially symmetrical if you look at it from above. So, they don't really have a well developed head. There's no head part here or a tail at the back, right? Um, they also contain lots of stinging cells in order to trap food, okay? Um, also, Nidarians have no separate mouth and anus. That's an important characteristic of the Nidarians. Uh, food comes in and goes out again from just one hole. Okay, so uh, just so there's no separate mouth and in it. There's no one-way movement of the food from one point to, to the end. Okay, um, so yeah, like I said, it contains things like corals, jellyfish here, and corals here. You can see anemones. You can have uh, fossil jellyfish preserved. But remember the, the two type, the two characteristics which are important for fossilization: hard parts and uh, burial rate, right? So, but yeah, most commonly you will get lots and lots of coral fossils rather than jellyfish. Jellyfish are special case preservation. Okay, so we'll just focus on uh, the fossils of corals in this course under the class Anthozoa, and the Anthozoa secrete a calcite skeleton. So the taxonomy is here, Trilomidaria, the jellyfish and the corals. Look at just one single class, the class Anthozoa, which are the corals. Uh, then class Anthozoa is divided into three, three groups. First order Rugosa, order Tabulata, and order Scleractinia. Notice the age range of these three orders. These two groups are extinct. They are no longer around for the Rugosa and Tabulata. The age range is from Ordovician up to Permian. Both became extinct uh, due to the Permian mass extinction at the end of the Permian. Okay? Now, when they went extinct, the Scleractinians became the dominant type of coral. Maybe they are probably replacing the niche that was left by the other types of uh, corals here. So they came into being during the Triassic and are still around today. So all the corals that you observe in modern day oceans, they are members of the order Scleractinia. Okay, we go one by one to the three orders of corals. First order, Rugosa, age range Ordovician to Permian. 
characteristics. So this is the general shape of a typical solitary horn, uh, sol typical solitary rugose coral. Okay. What, what I mean by solitary, it means that it's, it has a body here. Yeah? It's just made up of one individual. It lives alone, right? So it's solitary. And the solitary coralites, the coralite is the tube of an individual organism. So this single individual organism, is uh, the, the skeleton, is called the coralite. And the coralite in solitary rugose corals is horn-shaped. And uh, yeah, one of the common names that people that geologists give this are horn corals. Okay. Horn-shaped coralite. At the top, you have a cup-shaped top. It's called the calyx. This is where the soft part of the animal lived. Okay, so you have tentacles coming out here, just like a sea anemone. So this is a reconstruction of the animal. You have the coralite at the bottom here, and the individual soft parts at the top with tentacles. Okay, that's how it will probably looked like that when it was living millions of years ago. Uh, so cup-shaped uh, top, and the outer surface of the coralite is very wrinkly. Look at yeah? So, or another, another way we, we say that it is rugos. So that gives it the name, so rugos coral. Now, if you look at, if you, if you cut into a cor uh, the coralite of a rugos, eh, you'll notice that the coralite is divided in, uh, by vertical walls. This here, these walls here, call them septa. And they radiate from a central pillar in the middle. Okay, so all these walls here called septa. And, uh, as the animal grows, the more and more septa are added into the coralite. Okay? The septa grow and they divide the coralite into four sections. So these individual lines here represent the growing septa. And notice how they grow. They grow from four different parts. From here, and grows outwards in this direction, goes outwards in this direction, and here and here, right? So we divide the coralite into four parts. One, two, three, and four. Okay, so that's an important character of rugose corals. Septa grow to divide the coralite into four sections. So that's a pattern that grows uh, from younger and older and older, okay? So, yeah, in terms of life habit, habitat, uh, they have been interpreted to have been marine organisms. You find the fossils associated with other marine organisms, like bivalves, other kinds of mollusks, uh, echinoderms, and so on. Uh, they were marine. They were benthic, like most corals. They live, uh, like all corals, where they live on the seafloor. They can be solitary or colonial. These examples here, the horn corals, are solitary. They live as individuals, but they can form large colonies. And a single colony of a coral, we call it a corallum. And this is a section of a colony. So that's one coralite, that's another. So you have five coralites here forming a coralum. Okay, that's a colony here. Okay. And each one has, you can see the septa radiating out from a central pillar in the middle. Okay. So all these corals are filter feeders. What do I mean by filter feeders? So you have uh, particles in, suspended in the water. So these animals filter out these particles and eat it as food. Second order, we order tabulata. Age range is also Ordovician to Permian. Uh, we tend to have a small coralite. Okay, just for a cartoon diagram here. That's one coralite, that's another and another. So this is a colonial corallum, right? Corallum means whole body of colony. They're small coralites in the corallum, and the coralites uh, have these distinct horizontal plates. These horizontal plates here that we call tabula. They like uh, they form like different stories to a skyscraper, right? Like, so you make a cross section, this is an example here, and you notice all these tabula. All these are individual tabula. Okay, and that gives the name to the order. Um, so, like rugose corals, tabulate corals also have septa, but the septa are very poorly developed. So, these are the septa. These are very small, and visually, they are almost non-existent. 
in some examples, okay, you even see them okay, very weak. Okay. So we still have septa, but they are poorly developed. And in terms of life habit and habitat, they also they were also marine animals, benthic, and they were colonial and filter feeders. Okay. So in this course, you need to know uh, two genera. Genera is the plural for genus. Eh? Two genera of uh, fossil tablets. First, uh, well, why do you need to know up, up to genus level for this group, you might ask? Well, these two genera are very easy to identify, that's why. Okay. So first you have Favocytes. The Asian is from Silurian to Devonian. And they have small, rarely observed septa. So we have a look like, yeah, this is a whole corallum, right? The colony. And it has a honeycomb pattern, right? And these individual polygons here represent individual coralites where the organism live. Okay. And you notice you don't really see well-developed septa. But you can see the first, uh, the, the topmost tabula right, preserved here. So yeah, that's favocytes, honeycomb pattern, right? Very easy. Then you have helicytes, uh, or the vicin to Silurian age range. Uh, we have a common name for it, uh, the chain coral. Because they form a chain-like pattern, like a rantai. Right? So the large holes here are not the animal, okay? So these are the individual coralites. Right? You see the solid tabula. Yeah. Okay. So those are the chain corals, which are helicytes. I just want to show you one example from Malaysia. Uh, these are from the mudstones of uh, the Kubang Pasu formation in Perlis. I like going to Perlis, lots of fossils there. So I just show you examples here. Again. Um, so it's, this is very small. This is probably about one centimeter in diameter. So take note, this is an internal mold. All right, this is an internal mold. So the actual body is represented by the empty spaces in between. And this is just an impression. Okay. So what you see are these lines here. These are uh, so, so these cone-shaped structures here are actually the individual coralites radiating out from the center. So this is a very small corallum, small colony. Uh, you notice things like these protruding bumps here. These are your mural pores, these openings. And then you have the tabula, these lines here, the segments here. Okay. So it's very small, but I like uh, this, uh, this. This is uh, the genus Michelinia uh, from and it is carboniferous in age, and they are beautifully preserved in, in, in the rocks in Perlis because they have a very nice color to them. So I like to collect them. Okay, so all these are marine, benthic, colonial, filter feeders. Final group of corals, Order Sclerectinia, the modern day corals. They have been around since the Triassic, still around today, up to recent. And like the, they're very similar. Superficially, they look like the, the rugose corals. We have, uh, so this is a corallum and the individual coralites here. I look at the photo here. So these are the individual coralites in the corallum. And they have distinct septa, just like the rugose corals. But the pattern of growth is very different. First, they have six primary septa. One, two, three, four, five, six here. All right, there's six primary septa. And as the animal grows, you insert more and more septa at 60 degrees separation. So you'll get a nice radial pattern to your, uh, to your septa. Yeah? So nice, do to the insertion of septa at 60 degrees separation. So that is how you differentiate between rugose corals from sclerectinians. Another thing you observe is that, uh, Sclerotinians have a smooth outer surface compared to the rugose outer surface of the rugose coral. Life habit and habitat is similar. They are, mar they are marine animals, uh, benthic, colonial, or solitary, and filter feeders. It's just to summarize here how to differentiate between rugosa and sclerotinia. That's the pattern, right? So insertion of more and more septa at 60 degree angles for the sclerotinians and insertion of more and more septa from four parts in rugosa. Okay. 
Okay, that's it for today's practical. Uh, those are the groups that you need to learn um, today. Uh, you can use the Digital Atlas of Ancient Life. I'm going to give you instructions uh, in Spectrum. Um, just uh, as a summary here, what do you need to know about the different specimens that you will be looking at in the class? What do you know? What do you need to know? You are required to know the following for each group of fossils. The classification from phylum to the taxonomic level in the lecture notes. Some specimens you need to know up to order level or up to family level. But some specimens like Phasophocytes and Halicytes, you need to know them until the genus level. Right? So, for example, if a Phasophocytes is called as provided, you need to know it's part of Tabulata, of Anthozoa, and Midaria. You need to identify, uh, you need to yeah, know the identifying characteristic. Right? For Phasophocytes, for example, you need to know it's, it's, these are small colonial corals, indistinct septa. Uh, clear tabula, uh, correlates or hexagonal cross section. Draw a label diagram for the different specimens. The easiest way to learn about these things is by drawing. Yeah, and by drawing, it is a an act of memorizing and learning. Okay, I'm sorry, but you are in first year here. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of road learning. You need to familiarize yourself with fossils rocks and minerals because there's not going to be enough time during second year and third year to revise all this. We're going to go up and running prepared you must be familiar with the language so when the geo another geologist comes to you you know what he is talking he or she is talking about where he says uh, that's a phyllite rock or that's metamorphic that's horn blend uh, and that's uh, i think that's a rugos coral so it's going to be very helpful you need to know the common language of geologists so, yeah, in order to become a geologist. Okay? So you need to know the geologic, geologic age of the different groups. Right? For tabulata, for example, you know, need to know that they only range from the Ordovician to Permian. They, they were only present during the Paleozoic. The paleo environment and mode of life, I have uh, made it simpler in the, in the, in the lecture, uh, made it life habit and habitat. State where they lived on land or in sea, fill in the details. Okay. Um, additional notes, anything of interest, you think it's important, put it down. For example, fossil electrolytes are usually preserved as carbonaceous compressions and so on. Okay. So each specimen, you need, uh, you need to prepare a report okay, for this course. For each specimen, you need to write a report like this. On an A4 sheet of paper, put your name and metric number there. Uh, provide the specimen number, provide the taxonomy, the identified characteristics, geologic age, and the uh, habit and life habit. Okay, describe it there. And then draw a diagram, simple flight diagram of the specimen. I don't want you to draw a diagram from a textbook. That's not going to help you. you. You need to learn how to, to make these kinds of reports. Make a sketch, an actual, the sketch of the actual specimen, how it looks like. Maybe the specimen is broken, so draw that it is broken, and then try to identify different characteristics and label for different characteristics, such as for this Google Scholar here. So a little bit of note about the orientation of your sketching. You can sketch a specimen from different orientations, right? So you can have a top view. A top view, we call it a dorsal view. A ventral view is a bottom view, and from the front is anterior, and posterior means back. So try to do this trial and error, okay? And uh, we have a discussion later on in Google Meet, okay? So okay, that's it for today. Okay, bye.